And we're on Psalm 48, Psalm 48, page 472, or if you've got a larger print, one of the blue ones, it's page 558. So Psalm chapter 48. Let's listen to God's words. This is a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion, in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. For behold, the kings assembled, they came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded, they were in panic, they took flight, Trembling took hold of them, their anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind you shattered the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. As your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go around her. Number her towers. Consider well her ramparts. Go through her citadels that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God forever and ever. He will guide us forever. Amen. Would you please sit down? Would you turn back in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 48? Psalm 48. Now, when you think of the church, what words come to mind? Just have a think now. What words come to mind when we think of the church? I wonder what you've thought of. Are they positive words like friendly or lively or spiritual or caring or worshipful? I don't know, maybe you thought of negative words. Old-fashioned or divided, bigoted, hypocritical. Now, whatever you thought of, the thing we've got to remember is this. We are the church. We're a little expression of of God's people all across the world. So that word may be talking about us. Now, we we know some of those words are out of place, aren't they? We, We wish they weren't there. They're expressions of our sin, our failings. But others, they're key features of, of what it means to be the church, which, which depends on who we are. What, what happens on the surface is kind of the, the bubbling over of who we are deep down as the church. And this glorious psalm we're going to look at uh, this evening gets to the heart of that. It shows us who the church really is. So l- listen up. Let this psalm fuel your vision for the church. Let it lift your sights for us as God's people. But not just to kind of big ourselves up, you know. This evening, evening sermon isn't just some kind of ego boost for you, okay? No way. We, what we will soon realize is it's actually not about us, but about the God who lives amongst us. He makes us who we are. We are His. Kind of like a medicine spreading through a body, so His glorious presence makes us something extraordinary. So let's uh, get into this psalm. But with, with all the, the, the talk of the church, you may be thinking, well, actually, as you read through it, the church isn't mentioned. This psalm seems to be actually be all about a city. It's, it's a magnificent uh, city, as we'll see. It's a, it's a city that was impregnable from enemies. And then near the end of the psalm, you're meant to walk around this city and see the different things, the ramparts, the, the citadels. It, it seems to be actually all about Jerusalem. 
the city, not the church. Should we just head off to the Middle East? Well, no. Now, now cities have, have always been more than their bricks. Okay? They've often played a, a metaphorical or symbolic role in our culture. You know, is that what's going on here? Now, I know it's a bit old, but the, the classic film Gladiator, okay, set in ancient Rome, there's a really interesting subplot uh, about what Rome is and what it stands for. Uh, Maximus the gladiator, he calls Rome the light. Uh, the, the emperor Marcus Aurelius says this. There, I won't try and copy it too much. There once was a dream that was Rome. You could only whisper it. Anything more than a whisper and it would vanish. It was so fragile. Is, is that what a city is? An ideal, a vision, a way of inspiring people. Just, just whisper the name Aberdeen and it brings awe. You know, is that, is that what this psalm is? Kind of a, a vision of, of, of some kind of city that doesn't exist. It kind of acts as an inspiration, kind of Jerusalem the Magnificent. Or is it something different? Again, in Gladiator, a, a senator speaks of Rome like this. He says, Rome is the mob. Conjure magic for them and they'll be distracted. Take away their freedom and they'll still roar the beating heart of Rome is not the marble of the Senate, it's the sand of the Colosseum, a great little speech. But rather than ideal, it's a people, it's a reality, it's real people in real places, the real Rome was the mob. Is that what Jerusalem is? The people walking its streets? Well, actually, in this psalm, we're going to see both at play, and that's really important. The language of Jerusalem here is clearly pointing beyond itself. It's given grand language, a holy mountain, beautiful in elevation. It wasn't a very big hill. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole world, Mount Zion. It feels too grand, too lofty for a normal city of sweat and dirt and blood and bricks. But that doesn't mean it's not real. It's not real people. Just look at verse 8. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts. This is real people experiencing God's security and goodness, as we'll see. And that's why the New Testament brings this together. It brings together ideas too lofty for any normal city, but it keeps it centered on the people. It shows us that that in Christ there is a new Jerusalem. And that heavenly Jerusalem is actually the church, the people of God. Jesus speaks of the church as a city set on a hill. Now, the old Jerusalem was real, but it was always pointing beyond to God's people, finally as they were meant to be. Just think, just as the temple was at the, the center of Jerusalem, the old Jerusalem, God's presence at her heart. So Christ is the new temple at the center of his church, his new Jerusalem. And that lofty language speaks of the final congregation of all of God's people. The glorious new Jerusalem in the new creation. People in perfection. And it has begun in miniature. In God's small gatherings across the world, across the centuries. Right now, we are a small group of the New Jerusalem. It's not an ideal, not an inspiration, but real people being more and more transformed into our final likeness. So as we get into this psalm, this amazing imagery of a city and buildings needs, needs to point you to people, God's people. We are citizens. Yes, of Aberdeen, but more fundamentally of a heavenly city, of God's city, the church. But what is this, city, this church like? Well, firstly, it's God's magnificent church, his magnificent church. Just listen to the way the psalmist describes Jerusalem. Uh, his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. What an incredible description. Simply put, it's magnificent, isn't it? It's holy. 
It means it's set apart. It's distinct from anything else. No city is like it. It rises head and shoulders above the rest. It's, it's touching the clouds of heaven. It's the place of the royal and divine throne. It's superior to any pretenders to the throne. It's of such incredible grandeur and significance that it, it stirs the hearts of all who see it. Only joy, joy can well up as you behold such a city. It's magnificent. And it's like this, not because of the craftsmanship, not because of hard work. No, this is all because of the presence of God. Verse 1, it's the city of our God. It's His holy mountain. Verse 3, within her citadels, God has made Himself known as a fortress. Jerusalem was a, an ordinary city to look at. It had a wall. Gates, houses, streets, a citadel, a palace. But that is not all. It was a holy, beautiful, joy-inducing, royal city, a magnificent city because God was within her, because he resided there, because his temple was at her heart. It's like a, a light shining out of a cracked vase, bringing a, a rich beauty in the darkness. Or perhaps think of it like a, a person's inner resilience, goodness and character shining out of a scarred and deformed face. So God's presence at its center transformed Jerusalem into a city of such lofty grandeur, into a city worthy of stories and legends. That is the church of Christ. That is God's church, God's magnificent church. His, his presence comes to us, ordinary people as we are. And he transforms us into something incredible. We're the people of God. We're his treasured possession. We're his holy mountain. He's made us holy and elevated, transforming us to be holy in Christ. Just think of the sacraments, baptism. It shows that we're washing away of the old. And the Lord's Supper is we're, we're putting on the new, taking on Christ, becoming more like him. We're being made holy beautiful, joy-inducing. As His Spirit works in us, so we begin to shine, shine with the, the light and hope, love, peace, fellowship, goodness. We're God's one people, united together, one city of God, one city of the great King. It's God's magnificent church. Of course, it's not perfect yet. There are many sins in the church, but just think of God's people across the nations and generations, millions, perhaps billions of them, communities of fellowship and love, places of hope, places of peace, where Christ has been honored, where hope's been displayed, where burdens have been lifted, tears wept together, joy shared together, all to be brought together into one glorious city with Christ's throne at the center when he returns, then to be truly magnificent. What an extraordinary hope. Do you see the church's magnificence? Now, this isn't down to us. We don't congratulate ourselves. This isn't just kind of believe in yourself. You can do this. You've got this. You know, get your self-esteem boosted. No, this is a gift. This is a gift from the presence of God. It's all His grace to us. Isn't that amazing? We're defined by Him. What marks us out is not what we do, but who is amongst us. That means the church isn't just like any other social club or group. You know, we're not the photography club or the, the 6 a.m. gym monkeys. You know, we are the magnificent church of God, inhabited by God Himself. Like, that's why worship is at the beating heart of what we do. Because it's in worship we engage with the God who's with us. We acknowledge His grace and presence. We remember His power transforming us. And the rest of what we do flows from there. It's from that center that we then you know, socialize. We have small groups. We do mercy ministries. Whatever it is, if, if worship is lost, we'll, we'll only be just a club because we'll have ignored what defines us. So if you've got a friend who, who wants to know what Christianity all is about, perhaps invite them to church to come and be with us for a bit. 
I know that might be a big step for someone, but it's the best place because they'll see what God is up to. He's making his church. They'll see our worship of the triune God. They'll see us confess our sins to Christ. We'll praise and listen to God, see us forgive each other, see us lift each other's burdens. They'll, they'll see something of the living God transforming his city. Not that we'll be perfect, but instead they'll realize that God is amongst us. They'll see something of Mount Zion, experience what God's presence does for his people. They'll glimpse the joy of the whole earth. Why? Because it's God's magnificent church. But is, is this just a fad? Is, is, is God's city more like a snowflake than a mountain? Will the church be beautiful one moment and then melt away like another fragile, breakable? Well, God's presence doesn't just mean magnificence. It also means security. It's God's secure church. It's his secure church. In, in verse 3, the, the psalm shifts its focus. It shifts from the wide angle, kind of the glory of the city as a whole, down to the close-up view of the citadel. You can see that it's kind of the castle keep at, it, at the center. Thick stone walls, giant oak gates, fastened shut you know, with huge pieces of steel. But this is not what makes her secure, verse 3. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. God has made himself known as a fortress. And, and to show what that means, this song then begins to sing of enemies. Verse 4. For behold, the kings assembled. They came on together. Now for a small, excuse me, a small nation like Israel, this is a, a real and terrifying situation. You know, imagine just standing on the city wall, staring out and, and seeing columns of dust rising into the sky as thousand upon thousand march towards your city from every angle. An army from the north, an army from the south, an army from the east, an army from the west. That the noise reaches you, you know, the clanking of shields, the, the blasts of the trumpets. Perhaps the, the singers of this psalm knew of that. They knew of the armies of, of Moab and, and Ammon and Maon who rallied against King Jehoshaphat. Or perhaps they knew of the Assyrians the feared and terrible Assyrians marching to the city walls against King Hezekiah. Now on the whole, we as a church don't face enemies in quite the same way, do we? But there are still enemies, whether spiritual or human. I thought about that this morning. Enemies that aim to crush the church, to crush it through temptation, through false doctrine, through intense persecution, they assemble, they come on together from different angles, but will the church stand? Verse 5, as soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They're in panic. They took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there. I, I love this. The, the enemies look on and they leg it. This isn't, I came, I saw, I conquered. This is, I came, I saw, I panicked, and I fled. The, the, the gaze at the, the might of the great city of God, and they know they've got no hope because God is their fortress. You know, the psalmist says their, their anguish was like that of a mother in labor, excruciating distress. The victory was like that of the wind smashing the ships of Tarshish. This is a, a power that nothing could withstand, a huge gale forcing unwilling ships against knife-edged rocks. It's a complete rout. It's a total victory. That's uh, the kind of victory, actually, Jehoshaphat experienced against the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Maonites in 2 Chronicles 20. That they left the city for battle and found the enemy just dead. And that's the kind of victory Hezekiah experienced against the Assyrians in 2 Kings 19. That the enemy was left for dead by disease or they'd simply fled. All through God's power. It's amazing. Listen to what the prophet, a prophet said to Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles. He said, Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours but God's. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. The Lord will be with you. This is God's 
utterly secure city. God is her fortress. Now, these victories were great, of course, but the psalm knows there's something deeper at stake. Verse 8, God will establish her forever. Verse 14, God will guide us forever. Actually, if indeed, if you look at the footnote, he will guide us beyond death. This, these lifetime military victories are just a picture of a greater victory. Over the thousands of years before Christ of God's people, and the 2,000 years since Christ, God has kept his people secure. Now, yes, at times he saved them from external armies in this life, but more than that, he's kept them safe from darker enemies for eternal life. It's God's secure church. As, as Christ himself said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. His church is secure. That the church has faced enemies bringing heresy like heresies that denied Christ as God or denied his saving grace. The church has faced persecution from the Romans, from communism, from Islamic theocracies, from, from secular governments. It's faced devil-induced, sin-fueled temptations towards worldliness, towards complacency, comfort, ease. And yet Christ still is building his church. He preserves his elect for eternity. And the final victory will be total. Our world is, is not in some endless yin-yang of good and evil. The forces of darkness will have nothing on God and his king. Victory is his. The church is secure because God is in her. He's the fortress. It's not our schemes or plans or buildings. He, he triumphs and destroys his enemies through his great king. Jesus Christ, whose death made a public spectacle of them. And he will return to fully destroy them. And he keeps us. He keeps us by his preserving work. He does it in our weakness. He does it through the power of his almighty spirit, working in our hearts, uniting us to the king. Salvation belongs to the Lord. He does not fail. As Jesus said, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hands. The new Jerusalem, it's not some kind of, oh, it might happen. We hope someone might be saved. No, it's certain, a certain future. There will be a multitude in heaven, more than the sand on the seashore, more than the stars in the heavens. If you're a believer this evening and you're struggling for assurance, or you worry that your efforts are too small or meaningless, do not fear. May his word assure you this evening. Trust in the Lord. Hide yourself in him. Because we are God's secure church. But why has God placed these amazing benefits on his church? Well, thirdly, it's because we are God's loved church. We're God's loved church. Just in verses 9 to 11 here. Now, the, the psalmist turns to the character of God, verse 9. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. Let's just think on that steadfast love for a moment, this covenant love, chosen, promised love. It's a love, the psalmist says, that is shown in God's righteousness and justice. Verse 10, your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let, your mount, let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. God's church is magnificent and secure because it's all founded on God's love. He has chosen to shower his love on her, to pour out his affection on unlovely people. And he does it through extraordinary acts, acts of righteousness, holy judgments. And of course we see it most perfectly in his sending of Jesus Christ. God's love is brought to us, it's shown to us in, in what some call the Christ event. It's shown in Jesus' perfect obedience, living a beautiful human life, even to death on a cross, under the penalty of sin, to then rise again in glory. Jesus Christ, he's the, the full revelation of God's love. As the Apostle John says in his first letter, 
In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The church has everything because it's united to this Christ. He's our head, we are His body. He's the vine, we are the branches. He's the cornerstone, we're the bricks. He's our shepherd, we are His flock. Let's just consider Jesus for a moment. We're we're magnificent because we're with the one who is truly beautiful, glorious, and lofty. Jesus Christ, he's the, the, the one who is truly holy, radiating God's goodness and mercy. He's the one who's magnificent. He's the true place of God's presence. The light that shines out of us in moments of kindness, in times of heartfelt worship as we forgive, as we live at peace, as that light shines out, that is the awesome light of God shining in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's his power working miracles in his people. Or take security, we are secure because Christ truly stands secure. Temptation could not overwhelm him. Satan could not distract him. The the Pharisees could not trick him and death could not hold him. He is the victorious king, God in flesh. As enemies surround, they see the security, the steadfastness of Christ. His feet firmly planted, his sword in hand, his victory already won. No wonder they turn and flee. And we're united to him. We are his city because the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. We are God's loved church. Let Mount Zion be glad. What extraordinary truth we're on Christ's coattails. God's magnificent church. God's secure church because we're God's loved church. So to finish, the psalm just gives us two applications. Consider well and speak well. Consider well and speak well. Firstly, consider well. Verse 12 and 13. Walk about Zion. Go round her. Number her towers. Consider well her ramparts. Go through her citadels. Now, as a kid and as an adult, actually, I love visiting castles like um, Donata Castle near Stonehaven. It's great to, if you've been there, to see the steep cliffs, the incredible walls, you know, you look at the portcullis and where the gates would have stood, you, you, you gaze at what makes this castle, you know, such a, a nightmare to capture and defeat. And we're to do the same with Christ's church. Look at her and consider, notice what makes her strong. What are her towers, her ramparts, her citadels? Now, when I first thought about this, my first inclination was to go through human things, our good works, our projects, our ways of doing things. But, but that misses the whole point of the psalm. Remember, it all rests in God, doesn't it? It's his presence, his character, his strength, his king. John Owen, the, the Puritan, uh, writing about this psalm a few hundred years ago, he points to, to five strong walls in Christ's church. He says, first, that the nature of Christ is our true king. Second, that the many promises of God. Third, his watchful providence. Fourth, his special presence. Fifth, his covenant. We would do well, wouldn't we, to consider these things more. Like analyzing, in a sense, military blockades. To to meditate on them to let them sink in a bit, to pause and thank God, to pause and and think about how great a king Jesus is, to spend time uh, remembering God's promises of security, to walk about, to go around, to number, to consider well, to go through. That's a lot of commands to really pay attention to this. And also to thank God as this gets expressed in God's people, as we see a worshipful church, a prayerful church, a humble church, because that's a church that is considered where the strength really lies. We're to consider well. And as we do, we'll speak well. Verse 13. 
that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God, forever and ever. He will guide us forever. If we consider, consider well what really makes us strong, so the church will remain strong for future generations. You know, if the, the advice we pass on is centered on the love of our God, His faithfulness, His King, His protection, all that He's done in Christ, then we will leave a church behind us in strength. We'll, we'll pass the gospel into the future. You know, we have benefited, haven't we, from wise, considered people of previous generations. Just quoted from John Owen many hundreds of years ago. And so may others benefit from us. This is a psalm of the, the name of God and His praise spreading out from the city, the, the whole earth in joy, His praise reaching to the ends of the earth. And, and that is not just geographical. It's also in time. May the next generation be in praise of our God so we might all praise as the new Jerusalem when the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. So may the city of our God be a place of joy and wonder at her magnificence, her security, all established in the love of our Savior. As the psalm says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. Amen.